Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Our speaker this afternoon attained his Master's of Divinity and Master's of Arts degree in Moral Theology from Mount St. Mary's Seminary in 1989. Ordained to the priesthood in that same year, Monsignor Pope has served at several parishes in the Archdiocese of Washington and was named a Monsignor in 2005 by Pope Benedict XVI. He has served as pastor at Holy Comforter St. Cyprian Parish in Washington, D.C. since 2007. He also blogs regularly for the Archdiocese of Washington. So please join me in welcoming back Monsignor Charles Pope. Monsignor Pope, it's such a joy to have you with us today, this first Sunday of Advent. Oh, good. Thank you very much. You know, um, the, the the overall theme, you know, of our um, um, our Advent observance here is, you know, keeping watch, keeping watch. And of course, that was very typified in the gospel for today in the Western Rite. And I say Western Rite because I realize that some of you go to Eastern Rites and some of you also go to the Extraordinary Form. But the Lord basically said, now, look, you, you got, you've got to keep watch. It's like a man going on a journey. I'm just paraphrasing, of course. It's like a man going on a journey and he leaves his servants in charge, each with their own particular responsibilities. Um, but he may return at any hour. So you need, he needs to find you busy about what he gave, gave you to do. And what I say to you all, I say to everyone else, watch, watch, watch. So you'll notice that this idea of keeping watch is not some passive watching or passive waiting. Let me let me give you an example. Um, if I'm waiting for a bus, you know, I'm 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 looking, is is it here yet? I'm just sitting there passively waiting for someone else to do something, namely pull a bus up. And I'm completely powerless in terms of what, whether or not they come on time or don't, or whether the bus is full or empty. You know, so you see the idea. I'm completely passive. I'm utterly powerless. I'm just sitting there waiting and watching. That's a, that's a passive waiting and watching. Whereas uh, when the Lord says to us, and by the way, the Greek word here that's translated watch is gregorite. Hmm? It means, again, literally to be watchful, to be ready, but in a very active sense. It's in the plural imperative, y'all, all y'all, keep watch. Now, this is not a passive form of the verb, it's active. So what's the difference between active and passive watching or waiting? Well, think about waiting like um, you can wait for a bus, or but you can also wait on tables. And you see how different? We use the verb wait in very different senses. Obviously, someone who's waiting on tables is very active. They're alert. They see what the customer or the, um, you know, they're watching, they're waiting. Does the water need refilling? Is there a, a need? Are they waiting for the check? You know, there's a, it's a very active, vivid kind of watching. Um, whereas uh, very, very different from that passive waiting. We also see um, that, you know, when you, when you talk about watching. So, for example, the idea is that um, I've always got my eye out for the fact that the master of the house, the Lord, Jesus puts it, the Lord of the house might return. I've got my eye out for that. And so in the meantime, I'm staying busy and active about the things he wants so that when he comes, he will find the house in order. He will find it uh, well kept. He'll find things in supply, you know, whatever we're required to do to keep the house, all right? So you see the vision here. This is not some mere passive watching or waiting. Now, with that in mind, though, I've kind of pulled in one direction. I almost want to pull in a different direction because part of what the Lord expects of us is to be still, to listen, to get quiet in front of him. 
So in other words, it's not like our duty is just to run around like Martha. But we also have to have Mary, see? In fact, by the way, just a, a quick take on the Martha and Mary thing. I'm a bit of a hawk on this. Some I, I hear too many sermons that go like this. Well, in the church, we need Marthas and we need Marys. No, we don't. We need Mary. Um, who sat at the feet of the Lord and listened. You see, because then you just run off doing stuff and you don't even know if the Lord wants you to do it, see? So it's not like, well, Martha is the active principle and Mary is the more uh, contemplative principle. No, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't buy it. Jesus is saying, Mary has chosen the better part and she will not be deprived of it. So Jesus warned, I'm not calling you to a mere activism or a mere busyness. I'm calling you to a careful reflective life that is um, where you sit at my feet and you listen to me. Now, look, you know, Martha's running around trying to prepare, prepare this big, you know, meal. There's no evidence that Jesus ever asked for that meal, right? He, what, what did Jesus most delight in? That he could feed others with his word. He, that's what he delighted in. It wasn't this, you know, serve me. So Jesus is a little more relaxed about all this. Martha's running around trying to prepare a meal. That she, There's no evidence in the text that she ever asked Jesus, do you want a meal? What can I prepare for you? So she kind of went off on her own agenda. Now, therefore, Mary is sitting at the feet of the Lord and listening to him. Now, at some point, Jesus might say to Mary, let's send out for pizza. You know, call the call the Domino's pizza people or whoever. You know, I don't mean to give an advertisement, but, you know. But the point is that at some point, Mary might hear a call from Jesus say, well, let's get up and do something just now. Uh, you know, but at the end of the day, the watchfulness and the red and the waiting isn't just some activism. Do you follow me? Just I'm going to go off and run around and stay busy the way I think the Lord wants me to be busy. Question is, a lot of us, you know, run off and do stuff that we got no business doing because we never asked the Lord about it. And it might even be a good thing. Well, I'm going to go found a hospital or I'm going to engage in the great work of charity. But we never asked the Lord about it. We never said, you know, Lord, is this what you want me to do? Even with more serious things like getting married. It's surprising to me how many people just get engaged. Is it, have you asked the Lord about this? Well, we're in love, Father. We're in love. You know, what, what more is there needed? You know, well, uh, you know, it might be good to ask the Lord about this, you know, but or you take a new job in a different country, a different country or a different state. Your whole family gets uprooted and you move. Do you ask God about stuff like that? See, so what we want to be avoid, we want to be careful when we have this theme of watching and waiting is that uh, obviously it's not a passive watching and waiting, but neither is it an activist watching and waiting. We want that middle ground where we're able to still our soul and make room for God so that that still small voice of God that Elijah heard, not in the earthquake, uh, not in the uh, fire, uh, not in the, the howling wind, but that still small voice where he said, Elijah, what's the deal, man? You're all worked up about stuff. What are you all worked up about? Well, Lord, it's just me. I'm the only one left. And the Lord finally said, Elijah, I got 7,000 people back there in Jerusalem that never bent the knee to Baal. And I got something for you to do. Now get up, eat, and let's get you moving. But you see, he had to get still to hear the voice of God. And this is what we mean in Advent. Um, it's not a passive waiting or watching. Neither is it an activist waiting or watching. It's that contemplative waiting and watching where we're looking for the Lord, listening for his voice. And we're, we're asking him to help us to understand and to, to recognize, you know, his voice. And then we, we do, we go about what he does. So with that in mind, I want to read you a few scriptures that I have. Okay. Um, that might kind of guide us. Um, in this prayerful watching and waiting, because I think in Advent, we want to make room in our heart for God. We want to, uh, and, and that means that we got to just push some things out of the way. You know, maybe there's something to give up for Advent or maybe something to take on. Now, we don't talk a lot about that in Advent, but Advent was originally a penitential season. It is not described that way by the, at least the Western 
right of the church now. But in the Western church, we've all but abandoned any penitential quality, any abstemious quality um, in Advent. It's more, we wear purple, that's about all that's left. Um, we omit the Gloria, that's about all that's left. For me, I'm, I'm giving up something for Advent, a minor thing, and it's a shorter so-called abstinence or fast, but uh, I, I still try to do that. And I'd recommend that to a lot of you because I think that um, we, um, we almost never think about that in Advent, at least in the Western Roman Rite. Um, and I'm not saying you're required to do it, you're not. In fact, you're not even required in Lent, except on those prescribed days of abstinence to give up something for the 40 days. It's a pious tradition that you're encouraged to do, but you're not required. So my only point to you in all that is you might think of penance, I mean, as Advent as a as more penitential than you do, because what we want to do is we want to make room in our hearts for God um, to listen to him so that when the Savior comes, there's room in the inn. Because there was no room in the inn when he first came. And we want to make sure that in the inn of our heart, there's some room. And that means we sometimes have to make the room. Okay, now let's give some scriptures here to talk a little bit about watching, waiting. Okay, from Isaiah 30 and the verse and 15, Isaiah 30, verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, you will be saved in quietness and in trust be your strength. He goes on to say, but you were unwilling. So you see, part of, I think, what we do to clear room in our hearts during Advent is to find a little extra time for prayer. You say, but Father, but Father, I'm more busy than ever. There's, well, th this year, maybe not so, so much <laughs> with COVID, right? Oh, gosh, COVID, the gift that keeps on taking. <laughs> but anyway, um, but, you know, maybe we're not doing quite as much shopping this year or Christmas parties and things. So maybe uh, there is a little extra time to spend that time and say, Lord, what you really want me to do in Advent is to just take some time and be quiet and be still with you. Like Martha, I'm sorry, like Mary at your feet, not the activist, but the, the contemplative listening to you. And eventually you'll have something for me to do. But for now, I want to not passively wait or involve myself in activism, but to be still, to sit at your feet, and to listen to you. Now, how do we listen? Well, sometimes you just sit there and listen. But sometimes we listen with our eyes. You can take up some of the scriptures for the day and read them. But I mean, read them devotionally uh, in a way that is not just, oh, yeah, 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 this passage. Yeah, yeah, I know this one. And you just quickly read it and you're done. But rather, you, you read a few lines and you stop. What's the Lord saying to me? What does this mean for me? It's kind of a Lexio Divina. Hmm? And we've talked about that here at the ICC on many occasions. Any of you who've been regulars here know that you've got lots of places to go if you want to learn the full Lexio Divina method. But basically, it means to slowly, carefully, devotedly read the Word of God, to then meditate and pray over it, and um, make some sort of resolution um, as you finish. So again, this would be again, uh, in returning and in rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust, your strength lies. Okay, so this is an, an image for prayer. Hmm? Another, another passage from Habakkuk says this, uh, Habakkuk 2 and verse 20. <clears throat> but the Lord is in his holy temple, so that all the earth be silent before him. Now, as Catholics, this is a beautiful thing for us because the Lord's in his tabernacle. And even if you don't have regular Eucharistic adoration going on 24 hours a day, most of you hopefully can still have access to your churches. They're not locked. But you can come to the temple of the Lord and pray. He's there. He's waiting. And you go before him and just keep silence for a little while and prepare your souls because the Savior is coming. And you want there to be room at the inn. When he comes. Another one, Psalm 46 and verse 10 simply says this, be still and know that I am God. Shh, be still. Stop all this running around. Stop for a minute. Just understand I am God. I'm your Lord. I'm your father. I love you. 
you can, you know, I, I, I have only the best things in mind for you. And even sometimes when you don't think the blessings all come in packages, you understand, I want you to know I'm in the blessing business. If you will just be still. There's an old gospel song we sing sometimes here at the parish. Be still, be still. You know, the God will fight your battles if you just be still. You know, just it's a kind of an old, an old spiritual. Be still. God will fight your battles if you just be still. Uh, so we have these these images, um, you know, of uh, being still, watching, waiting, being more contemplative, listening, making room in our heart uh, for God, okay? There is uh, so some other ones here. Uh, for example, Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 13. Be silent before the Lord, all people, for the Lord has roused himself from his holy dwelling. So now notice this. This is kind of a Christmas theme. God has roused himself from his holy dwelling. He's coming down from heaven um, at, to us. So therefore, what, what should we do? Be silent. Be silent before the Lord. All the people, all you people, for the Lord has roused himself from his holy dwelling. He's pointing to the coming of the Messiah. And what's our goal? Get all excited? Run around, decorate trees? No, be still. Be still. There's a time to decorate trees. But there's also a time to be still. Be still. So we're watching. We're waiting. Not passively and not with activism. But a, 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 an active listening to God in a very contemplative kind of a way. Another one, Zephaniah, um, chapter one and verse seven: Be silent, or be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. So again, stop all the acting, running around, shopping till you shop till you drop kind of stuff. Find time. If you got to do some of that stuff, get it done late. But find time to be silent. And quiet and still before the Lord. Shh. Stop. Stop. Wait, 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 wait. Shh. Stop. Stop. Cut it out. Shh. shh. But, but I have to um, be quiet. So this is the, um, we want to, uh, you know, emphasize this. There's a beautiful thing in the book of Revelation, chapter 8. And they're blowing the trumpets and all these terrible things are happening. But finally, it says, when the lamb, namely Jesus, opened up the seventh seal of the scroll, seven being a sign of perfection, right? When the word, if you will, is now perfected, if you will, the word made flesh, you know, this moment where the word comes forth from the womb of the Blessed Mother, if you want to just kind of put it in the Christmas cycle. When the lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven. Uh, for about a half an hour, <laughs> a half an hour, you know, but you see the idea. Take some time every day, maybe a half hour, maybe an hour, but take some time to grow silent. Open up that scroll. Now, you and I, you remember in the book, I'm going to grab my Bible here. In the Bible, it talks about a, a scroll with seven seals. Now, books were less known in those days. They call these codexes. This idea of a book that's bound here and you can you know, open up anywhere into it, it was fairly unknown at the time of the Bible. They had scrolls. And it's kind of like the old cassette tapes that some of us remember. You got to be a little older to remember that. I'm sorry. If you remember cassette tapes and you actually use them, you're old. Yeah, old. Okay. Um, but um, that's you, you, it's sequential. But, and so that's like those scrolls were like. So a scroll or a book, right? But look, brothers and sisters, because of Jesus Christ, we have a perfect right to open the scroll now, not by our own, uh, not by our own dignity, but by the glory of God to open up the scroll and understand the true meaning of life. You see, in that scroll in the book of Revelation was contained every answer and the whole meaning of life. And um, here it is. And no one was found worthy in heaven or earth to open up that scroll, break open the seals and open up that scroll. But then suddenly, do not be despairing, for the line of the tribe of Judah has conquered, and he is worthy to receive the scroll and break open its seals. And he breaks it open. And this is for us. 
what he's done for us. And so you and I, because of him and him alone, have the perfect right to break open this scroll and break open, you know, those seals. Only the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus, could do that for us. Now, what is scripture? I don't want to give you a long discourse on scripture. I want to just say this. Scripture is a prophetic declaration of reality. Whatever you think is going on, this is what's really going on. See, this is, tells us the meaning of our life, the goal of our life, the destiny of all creation, where things are headed. And by the way, I cheated and I looked at the back of the book. <laughs> it's still there. Thank God it wasn't blotted out. Jesus wins. Are you praying with me? I mean, you 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 understand this is a prophetic declaration of reality. It's not just an opinion. It's not just a lovely collection of stories, you know, or whatever people want. Or, you know, Thomas Jefferson liked the ethical teachings of Jesus, but not the miracles. It, this is bigger than any of that. This is a prophetic declaration of reality. This is, tells you what's really going on. This tells you what your life's really about, see? And so... Uh, as Jesus takes this scroll and breaks open that seventh seal and opens it, a whole meaning of everything is contained in it. And you know what? There was silence in heaven for a half hour. Be still. Put every thought out of your mind. God is about to speak. So when you take the scriptures and read it devoutly, maybe it's again like Alexio Divina. Don't just pull it over and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know this one. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've read this before. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember what Father so-and-so said about that. Uh-huh. Good. Okay, we're done here. No, no, no. Here's how you take it. Be still, my soul. Maybe for a half hour or whatever that, that is for you. Be still. God is about to speak to me. And every word is written in love. Verbum dei non est qualicumque verbum, said verbum spirens amorem, says St. Augustine. The word of God is not any old word. It is the word breathing forth love. This is a love letter from God. This is a letter of admonition, but it's also of love. And he says to us, I want you to understand the true meaning of your life, of the world, of what's going on all around you. And I want you to remember that you have the victory if you will stay with me. Even if they kill you, the worst thing they can do to you is kill you. Maximum promotion. You'll be among my martyrs in heaven. Okay? So I, I could go on and on, but I want you to see that there's this magnificent moment where the word... Again, remember, Jesus is the word made flesh, and we're getting to ready to welcome him again at Christmas. But the word made flesh breaks open this scroll, and the whole meaning of everything is set forth. And the prelude to that should be reverent silence. So it says, there was silence when the Lamb opened the seventh seal. There was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Now, as if to say, be still, my soul. God is about to speak. And what he's going to say is more important than anything I'll ever hear. I've got to still my soul and make room for this word. Okay. So this is an Advent theme of watching and waiting. Okay. Now, a couple of other things, uh, maybe a couple of other quotes and um, a few more remarks and maybe get some comments from you. Um, there is a um, there's a very interesting text from Wisdom in the 18th chapter, and it's actually talking about a very dreadful night when the angel of death went over and, um, and, and killed every firstborn in Egypt, but passed over the house of the uh, the houses of the Jewish people who had the blood of the lamb on their door. But it says this, and we can interpret this also, though, in more of a Christmas way. It says this from Wisdom 18 and verse 14. For when peaceful stillness encompassed everything and the night in its swift course was half spent, your all-powerful word from heaven's royal throne leapt into the, do into the doomed land. So as dreadful as that original meaning is, isn't this also a beautiful meaning for Christmas? That again, when... Peaceful stillness encompassed everything, and the night in its swift course was half spent. 
your all-powerful word, the Lord Jesus Christ, leapt from heaven's royal throne into a doomed land. Our land was doomed, but Jesus leapt into it to save us. And he didn't just so much come out to get us out of trouble as to get into trouble with us. And um, he comes to save and to set us free. And this all-powerful word leapt forth from heaven um, to, to be with us. Now, notice again, it's a doomed land. Um, remember, the original context of this is the angel of death coming and taking the first lies of all the Egyptians. But I want to say to you that what Jesus does on Christmas night is that he makes a daring raid behind enemy lines into Satan's lair. And he does it with silence, stealthily. We sing silent night, holy night, but it's really D-Day <laughs> in the sense that stealthily, quietly, Jesus comes in behind enemy lines and takes up his place. And Satan seems to be aware of something, but he doesn't quite understand. And you remember that he's aware that something's going on in his, his lair. And you remember how he wildly stabbed at, at all the two-year-old children, two years old, older and younger, uh, trying to find this Christ child. We think Satan is omniscient that he knows everything. He doesn't. He seems to be aware of a presence in, in his kingdom of some light, and he doesn't understand it. And through his agent, Herod, he's, he tries to find out who is this child. And he can't find him. And he wildly stabs, sadly killing all the holy innocents. But this image of Jesus quietly, silently, leaping down from heaven to a um, into our doomed world, or it says here, a doomed land to rescue us. You see the vision? And of course, all those Jewish people were re rescued in the, in the great Passover, and we too are taken out in this great Passover of the Lamb. So we see um, some, some very powerful images, but notice how silence is a key element to all of them, right? Silence. Waiting, watching, not passive, but not activistic, but that middle ground we would call kind of a holy, watchful listening to God, uh, like Mary at the feet of Jesus, as opposed to Martha, the activist, Mary sitting at his feet and listening to him. OK, now with that in mind, that's a, that beautiful um, picture of um um, let's see if I got my, I got to get my notes here. You know, that, that image of your, your eternal word leapt down from heaven into a doomed land, um, leaving his royal throne. I want to read you uh, an Advent hymn. For me, the, for my money, it's the best Advent hymn ever written. It was written by St. Ambrose. And it's not just a good Advent hymn. It's a kind of a summary of all, of all salvation history in about five verses. <laughs> It's amazing. But it picks up on that theme. Again, let me read it one more time from Wisdom. When peaceful stillness encompassed everything, and when the night in its swift course was half spent, your all-powerful word from heaven's throne leapt down into a doomed land. Now, here's what St. Ambrose writes. I'm reading not the Latin. He wrote it in Latin, but this is a good English translation that's also beautifully poetic. But listen to the majesty of this hymn and meditate on its magnificence. Come thou, Redeemer of the earth, come manifest your virgin birth. All lands admire, all times applaud, such is the birth that fits our God. And here comes the second verse. From Forth from his chamber goeth he, that royal home of purity, a giant in twofold substance one, rejoicing now his course to run. From God the Father he proceeds, to God the Father back he speeds, runs out his door, runs out his course to death and hell, and returns on God's high throne to dwell. O oh, equal to thy father thou, gird on thy fleshly mantle now. The weakness of our mortal state with deathless might invigorate. For your cradle here shall glitter bright, and darkness breathe a newer light, where endless faith shall shine serene, and twilight never intervene. A magnificent, just, just magnificent quick summary 
that, that, that one verse, all of salvation history, forth from his father goeth he, that royal home of, of, of purity, runs out his course to death and hell, returns on God's high throne to dwell. Just like that. Four verses, all of salvation history, right? Still yourself. And um, I'll publish it. You know, I have this on my blog, but I'll publish it this week about the best Advent hymn. But this is the kind of stuff. Get still, get quiet, and meditate on the glory of what took place at Christmas. Make room in your hearts for God. Make room. Quiet. Be still. Actively listen for God, like Mary at his feet. A final thought, and then I'll get your reactions. Um, a lot of us are anxious today. I mean, I'm anxious. We're all anxious. We got this COVID thing that just doesn't seem to want to go away. A lot of us are suspicious that we're either being lied to or that this thing is either more serious or less serious, where people are both a combination of anxious and cynical. You've got the election results. People are anxious and cynical on both sides of this. You've got, of course, just uh, the general, all the thing we went through with, uh, you know, the struggles with you know, racial injustice and that conversation on race we've been through in our country. All these things are going on and we're stirred up, we're anxious. And I get so many people who come to me all like, like this. And I say, you know what I say to them? You've been watching too much cable news. Don't watch so much of that stuff. You know, they are literally, you know, I would call it panic porn. Pardon the expression. It's, it's very ugly what they're doing to us. And I, I can, I can, the highest recommendation I can make to, to somebody in Advent is consider giving up a lot of that. You may need to keep some headlines. You may have a job that requires you to be on top of the, but at the end of the day, most of us don't need to be listening to half of that stuff or even 90% of that stuff. It's meant to get us angry. It's meant to get us fearful. You know, if you, if you find out what a person can fear, you can control them. And I have never seen this country so under control as I have now. We are, um, not to be afraid. Jesus, how many times did Jesus say, do not be afraid? Even of the worst thing, death or suffering. There is more to life than not getting sick or not dying. Most of you know I had COVID and I had it bad. I was 11 days in the ICU in, in respiratory failure. That's because I have pulmonary issues that one day, one day it'll kill me. We're all going to die of something. I might also get shot. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I hope not, but I mean, you know, but the point is that um, I, I, I was uh, in the high risk category, but you know, I got it. And sure enough, it went right for the lungs, but I, I'm, a, I'm a survivor. I was, I was treated and I'm well now. 99% um, of people who get it survived, you see. And yet we're all running around in a panic. Part of that, I'm not saying there's nothing to be concerned with here. I'm not saying 250,000 deaths are nothing. But I'm simply saying that somewhere we've gone over the top with fear, with anxiety, and not just about that, but also about elections or about uh, other aspects of uh, the race and all the things that are going on in our country. And I would say that you would do well in Advent to consider for your own peace of mind to watch a lot less news. Because they buy and sell on this stuff, all right? Uh, if that's too harsh, I'm sorry. But ju I just wanted to leave you with a practical suggestion. We all need to find more time to be quiet, to listen to the Lord, to prepare our hearts and make room in our hearts. And if they're all stirred up with anxiety and anger and frustration about everything that's going on in the world, which, by the way, much of it is very real, and I'm not saying we can completely ignore it, there were big stakes in this election, big stakes. But at the end of the day, there's not much we can do about it. You know, we had to go before God and say, I'm, I come before you like a blind beggar. I don't understand why the world's going in directions it's going in. But Lord, you do just show me what I should do and help me to stay in my lane and not get off into other people's jobs. So at the end of the day, I, I just offer that to you as a final suggestion. That said, again, back to my original theme. Let's get some then reactions from you. Uh, I was told to talk maybe about 40 minutes, so we're, we're just, just over that. So we have this idea of a waiting and a watching. But again, that middle ground between pure passive waiting. Is the bus here yet? No. Okay. 
that's passive. But also to avoid the activism that I gave you the example of Martha, but to find that active, that, 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 that alive, alert, watching and waiting that we see in Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, Mary of Bethany. Um, this is our Advent call, right? I, I think that one way to do that is, again, to get rid of some of this TV stuff I said. Uh, or another way, of course, would be to give up a little something else, but find that time to just be quiet with the Lord and carefully, quietly read his word, listen to him, and um, be ready when he comes. Let all mortal flesh keep silence and with fear and trembling stand. Um, ponder nothing earthly-minded, for with blessing in his hands, Christ our God to earth descends, our full homage to demand. And at his feet the six-winged seraph, cherubim with ceaseless eye, veil their praises to the presence, as with ceaseless voice they cry, Alleluia, Lord most high. Silence. With that in mind, any questions? <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Monsignor Pope, for that beautiful reflection. One of the things I was thinking of as you were speaking was, um, you know, my family had a much quieter Thanksgiving this year, just some of my immediate family, as opposed to typically we have a gathering of 40 or 50 extended relatives. So a lot of that time was spent quiet, like we were reading or each doing our own kind of uh, time together, but, um, and I kind of was reflecting on how, how to make time of silence. I feel like I am always wanting something to be purposeful and like driven or leading to something. And is it, is it having a set intention when you have time of silence to make sure that it's not feeling wasteful or is it okay if you sometimes just feel like it's wasteful, not wasteful, but yeah. I don't know if I can quite put into words. I, I know your point exactly. I, first of all, there are, you know, maybe very worldly people consider our time spent in worship as frivolous and wasteful. We burn things up, just give them to God, you know, incense and candles and, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Um, um, we're supposed to, um, you know, kind of, if you will, pardon the expression, waste time with God. Uh, in, in a certain sense, from the world's point of view, not 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 from truth. Our time spent in worship is, well, we could be out earning money. What do you mean take Sunday off? What are you talking about? I mean, we could be out earning money. Um, but they're, they're, no, no, actually, um, we're, God expects us to just take some time and waste it. Now, that's in the quotes, of course, from a worldly point of view. Um, but I would also say, getting back to your other question about silence, you know, silence isn't the absence of sound. It's the absence of self. Does that make sense? So in other words, you, you, you might, in your quote, silence, you might be listening to a very edifying song that helps you to focus on God. But something that gets you outside of yourself, we get so, if we're, you know, St. Augustine speaks of the, the human person is so easily in curvatus and say, he's just turned in on himself. And God wants to turn us out to love one another, to love him and to love others. And in this, we really find ultimately our goal. Um, so the idea of silence, again, isn't just the absence of sound. It's the absence of self. All focus, oh, this is going wrong. What am I going to do about this? What am I going to do about that? And just, have you ever been to a movie? Only once or twice in my life can I say this, that I was so brought into a movie that I watched that I lost any sense of myself. And all of a sudden, when I came back to myself, I was like, oh, my gosh. Um, but that's the goal. I think with the, this idea of silence, that is absence not so much of sound, but of self, all the fretting and worrying that we'd so easily do. And, and look, I'm, I struggle, we all do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, this question is coming from Joel from Missouri. Joel writes that he is new to Catholicism and wondering if you would have any suggestions on a text on penance from a respected source for helping to, him to understand penance better. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I be really uh, nasty and pro promote my own book? Oh, go for it, Monsignor Pope. I'm sure it's wonderful. <laughs> I wrote a book. It's just a little paperback. I mean, for, you know, I'm not known for brevity, but this thing is less than 100 pages. A little paperback you can even keep in your coat pocket. It's called The Ten Commandments. I stole the title, by the way. <clears throat> and it's a meditation on the Ten Commandments rooted in the teachings of the Catechism. And in the back, there are several 
Very, I, I think I got them from many sources, but several very good examinations of conscience. Um, but the idea is to sort of enter into the Ten Commandments in a kind of a richer way than just, well, I didn't murder anybody today. So Fifth Commandment, check a rony, you know, but to go a little deeper. Um, and it's a very brief book. It's meant to prepare people for confession. So called the Ten Commandments by Monsignor Charles Pope. And please, if there are some ICC talks and things that you can recommend, though, those would be good, too. Yes, certainly. Um, thank you, Monsignor Pope. I know that we have used um, that book and sent it to a few people when they've asked similar things. So I know that is a good one. Um, Ahmed, why don't you ask your question? Oh, um, I get the reason, like, why we have Advent, uh, you know, waiting for the second coming. But, I don't, like, why is that important when, like, Jesus comes to us every day uh in the Blessed Sacrament, in the Eucharist. Another question um, that kind of related to it, um, why is, you know, like, key visual or advent of seasons or it's only, well, mainly emphasized, uh, like, during this season rather than, you know, year long, if that makes any sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I think the church um, has seasons, and um, it, 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 it doesn't really pertain to us to keep 25 balls in the air juggling, you know. We're not very good at that. So sometimes the church says, let's focus on this part of the Paschal mystery right now. Let's focus over here on this. So well, in, in, at, in Lent, we focus on getting ready for the great Paschal mystery, the passion, death, and resurrection. In Advent, we focus on the um, getting ready for the incarnation. Um, other times and seasons, you know, we focus on discipleship, like in ordinary time. Ordinary doesn't mean ordinary, it means ordinal, like numbered Sundays. Um, and so I think like any good mother, the church knows that it's helpful for us to have a focus. Uh, even though, yes, everything's always true. It's never like, well, Jesus didn't really get born and, you know, we have to redo this. Uh, but rather, it's, it's an idea for us to, to spend some particular time and focus on getting ready for this or that aspect of, of our redemption history. Now, finally, this. Um, we speak of our, our remembering in the liturgical year as anamnesis. Anamnesis is not just we're recalling distant events from the past, but rather, no, that those events are made present to us. So Christ is born. Today is born our Savior, we say at Christmas time, Christ the Lord. Today. Well, wait a minute. That was 2000 some years ago. But no, no, no. It's made that event is made present to us. Likewise, every mass, as you said, I mean, he, Jesus always comes. He's present in the Eucharist. He's in the mass in every mass. But notice again, in every mass, the sacrifice of Calvary and his resurrection and ascension are all made present to us in that mass. It's not a distant event. Oh, look what he did 2,000 years ago. But rather, we get in our time machine and we're brought to that event or that event is brought to us. And this is, by the way, from the Jewish people who have the same concept that Passover wasn't just some distant event. You were, you, you're, 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 you're in the Passover. You're in the Exodus. How was this night different from other nights? The, the question goes. And the answer is, well, my father was a wandering Aramean and God, you know, and, and the, the thing goes on. But basically, we we are in these events and they're made present to us. But because of our humanity, where it's not possible to focus on 25 or 30 things, the church as a good mother bids us to kind of take certain times of the year and focus on these things. We are getting a lot of questions um, that I'll kind of synthesize into one, but most of them are really asking how. So how how can we listen with faith and not with doubt? How can we allow ourselves to mm -hmm. kind of be selfless and focused on reflecting on God and not letting our thoughts wander back to ourselves? Could you give some maybe practical steps into how to be still and how to pray in this way? Yeah, you know, it's um, it's easy to get discouraged when we just think about our own situation or if not our own situation, our own country at this time or you know, some of us who are pro-life think, well, God, you kind of let us down here. We're gonna, we never, it seems like anytime we get, you know, a little bit of progress, boom, uh, you know, you know, I could, we could, I could give you other examples, but I'm just trying to illustrate. I understand the discouragement that can come if we focus primarily on our own personal lives or on our own country or our situation. 
So the question is, well, how how to overcome some of this? I would argue that um, we need to look at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is really amazing when you think about it. Um, a lot of times people think, well, the church is down and out. Our numbers are dropping. And in the West they are, although in other parts of the world they're growing. But you get the idea. But, you know, i got news for you. The church is 2,000 years old. And i got even more news for you. If you take our Jewish uh, in our Jewish years, we're 5,000 years old. And you know what? Heresies have come and gone. Nations have risen and fallen. Empires have risen and fallen. Enemies of the church have said, we'll destroy you. Where's Napoleon now? Where's Caesar? You know, where's the USSR? They're gone. And here we are still preaching the same gospel. You know, I got. I just think that sometimes you got to see the broad sweep of history and see that the, that the church is indefectible, not by our, I mean, we're the mess, but the, but Jesus had said somehow in all of this, you may not always feel like you're winning, but there's more to winning than getting every battle, but to perdure and to continue to preach this same gospel. And you know, when all this current foolishness has come and gone, we'll still be here preaching. You know, the church is going to be here. People always promise, oh, you're about to be destroyed. You're nothing now. Nah. You know, so stay with Jesus. Stay with the winning team. We're, we are Noah's Ark. And guess what? The Ark is smelly. It's got a lot of crazy stuff going on. And even the eight people on the Ark don't get along very well. And they haven't bathed for like 35 or 40 days. But it's the Ark. And God is there. And we're going to get through this because we always do. Yes. Amen to that. Sharon, do you still have something to share? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah. I wanted to thank you, uh, Monsignor, for your comment on opening the scroll. It touched my heart. I could, you know, I will approach opening the scripture in a different way because of how that touched me. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I had, I had separated the scroll in, in other words, I didn't think of, uh, scripture as a scroll, but it was beautiful. But I also wanted to comment in going through the scripture, um, the Isaiah scripture, behold, you are angry. We are all sinful, unclean people. Even our good deeds are like polluted rags. We are beggars, you know, um, that I think that I had in, in my preparation, um, coming to the need, I need a savior. Mm -hmm. And it's like somewhere along the line, you know, um, I, I mean, I go to mass daily. I, you know, do Lexio, you know, uh, and I can sort of check that box and, mm -hmm. you know, maybe separate my uh, prayer life from my daily life. It's all of the same cloth, but that I need to be saved. And in the end, it is not I who saved myself. I, I mean, I can know that in an intellectual way, but to really touch my heart to know that Jesus Christ is the Savior and I need saving. This world needs saving. We are not able to save ourselves. And if we are not yet convinced of that, we should look about us. <laughs> and uh, instead of being discouraged to recognize that Jesus Christ has the victory and we are living into it in our fidelity to one another, it, it's it's not just my salvation. It is all of us in the ark, as you mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it touched me greatly. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, you get the point of the reading today. I actually made that the main point of my homily this weekend in the parish, which is that we need a savior. We're, 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 <laughs> we're in pretty bad shape without him. But with him, you know, so here's the basic kerygma. You want to, I'll give you a, a, a quick thumbnail of the kerygma that all the apostles taught in the, in, in, you know, there's about eight different sermons in the Acts of the Apostles. They, they call that the kerygma, the early preaching. Here's the basic model. You got it bad and that ain't good, but there's a doctor in the house and his name is Jesus. And if you will give your life to him, he will go to work in your life and he will begin to help you from the mess you are and the mess you've made. <laughs> that's that's my sort of urban dictionary version of the uh, of the, the basic kerygma that all the apostles say. They're very in, politically incorrect. You know, we're always, oh, don't don't be negative. We are we are a welcoming community. And and Peter says, you all kill God. 
you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You know, and they, they're struck to the heart and they repent. But you see the idea. I mean, it's a it's a powerful image today in Isaiah from the Roman right, uh, their first reading. Uh, my gosh, um, we need a savior badly. Mm-hmm. Yes, Monsignor Pope, um, we had Craig right, and you asked during your reflection about the um, practices in the Eastern church and he is greek malkite and says that during advent they start their fast on november 15th so they do fast yeah and and father hezekiah has also talked about that too just the period of fasting Mm -hmm. these guys are heroes compared to us in the western roman right we're a bunch of ninnies (laughs) (laughs) i say that with love i'm one of them but i try to add i try to do something during advent too yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so, Monsignor Pope, if you could um, lead us in prayer here at the conclusion of today's event. Yes, we thank you, Lord. And in the first re- uh, the first prayer for Mass in the Roman Rite today, you ask us to, uh, we ask that by your grace that we can run toward you who are coming toward us. And um, it's a beautiful image of um, you coming to us and we running toward you. So keep us faithful in that and um, keep us also faithful, though, to that that careful, uh, watchful silence that is necessary for us, where we don't just run off in our own direction, but we run with you. So, Lord, please now bless everyone, and may the peace and the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come upon all of you and remain with you forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us. Degree in philosophy and a master's in theology from St. Charles Borromeo Seminary a master's in education administration from Villanova University, and a doctorate in education from Immaculata College. A Philadelphia native, Bishop Michael Burbage attended St. Charles Borromeo Seminary in Philadelphia and was ordained a priest of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia in 1984. In 1998, he was made honorary prelate by His Holiness Pope John Paul II with the title of Monsignor. In 2002, Bishop Burbage was ordained a bishop to serve as an auxiliary in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia and then was installed as Bishop of Raleigh, North Carolina in 2006 and became the Bishop of Arlington, Virginia in 2016. Your Grace, it is such a blessing to have you with us here at the Institute of Catholic Culture. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Father Hezekiah. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate that introduction. And thank you, dear friends. I'll be talking a little bit about penance tonight. but It's, it's more of a reflection you know, on this first Sunday of Lent of how we might be able to enter this sacred uh, season. So nothing you haven't heard before, I'm sure. But I have been praying in anticipation of this evening uh, that I at least will be an instrument of the Lord speaking a message to your heart this evening. Uh, something that he wants you to hear specifically and uniquely at the beginning of this season. So perhaps something I say or something we read from sacred scripture or one of the quotes I use is just exactly what God wants you to hear. So let's just begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we pray that uh, we do open your hearts because we know that when we are gathered in your name, you are in our midst. So may our hearts be open to the word you want us to hear this evening, to the message you want us to reflect upon, and most especially to the graces and blessings you will bestow upon us as we begin this sacred season with the hope and desire that we'll be drawn ever closer to you in our relationship with you, sustained by your love and mercy throughout these sacred days and always through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So as a as a teacher, I love the mission when I look on your the web page uh, for the Institute. Know the faith, love the faith, live the faith. It says it all. Uh, and I 
thank you everyone for your witness and your commitment to do so. Uh, people who are truly trying every day with God's grace and supporting one another to know the faith, to love the faith, and to to live the faith. As a the educator in me, uh, I'd just like to uh, begin. Good teacher always says what we're going to do in class tonight. So let me just give a summary of what I hope to accomplish uh, this evening. Uh, dear friends, each Lent we deepen and express our interior conversion of heart through works of penance namely prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Their purpose is not to diminish our life or to make us feel or appear gloomy, but rather in them we find deep joy in the working of grace. For through them our whole lives are radically turned to God and placed in the service of his kingdom. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, we have begun again this solemn season of Lent. Over these next six weeks to celebrate our Savior's definitive victory over sin and death. Tonight, we pause to reflect on how we can more fully cooperate with God's grace with the hope that we may come to the Easter sacraments with the fullness of joy that comes from God alone. It is only fitting then that we ground this evening's reflection in a spirit of prayer. As we seek the true meaning of Lent, we heed the advice of St. Cyprian the third century bishop of Carthage, who notes what prayer could be more a prayer in the truth than the one spoken by the lips of the son who is himself truth. So wherever you are this evening, we are so grateful that you have taken the time to attend this evening virtual event. So let us pray together in the one spirit of Christ. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Truly, there is no part of the Our Father that does not express the deep meaning of Lent. For Lent is about an inner change of heart turning once again and more fully to our Father's will and the plans of his kingdom, seeking forgiveness and to forgive, asking for God's grace to overcome temptation in our lives and for God to free us from all evil. Each Lent, my friends, we deepen and express this interior conversion of heart through works of penance especially prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Their purpose is not to diminish our life or to make us feel or appear gloomy. Jesus told us on Ash Wednesday that same reality. Rather, in them, we find deep joy in the working of God's grace. That's why we call Lent a joyful season. Through them, our whole lives are radically turned to God and placed in the service of his kingdom. Our radical turning to God, which we call the inner conversion of heart, is never simply our own work, but our cooperation with God's action. That's a mistake we can often make, isn't it, when we begin Lent? There is just that natural tendency to tell God what we are going to do for him. And yet, I think Lent should really begin by us responding to the Lord's question, what do you want me to do for you? The well-known prayer for beginning work and study, which we have also prayed as the collect this past Thursday after Ash Wednesday, reminds us all that we do begins in God. Beautiful prayer. Just listen. Prompt our actions with your inspiration, we pray, O Lord, and further them with your constant help that all we do may always begin from you and by you be brought to completion. God's grace is before us always. It also sustains us and brings us to perfection. So our first, first task is to be attentive to it. We are called in a special way to be attentive to the word who proclaims the wonderful works of God, who reveals the path to his kingdom. Our profound Catholic tradition teaches that 
Christ himself is present whenever the scriptures are proclaimed in the church. And at Mass today, we encountered the word himself announcing the divine plan to us here and now today. Remember what we heard? This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repentance begins with acknowledging where we have gone wrong and seeking reconciliation with the Lord. Acknowledging where we have gone wrong can sometimes, perhaps even often, feel like gloomy work. After all, we cannot and should not deny that in this acknowledgement, we are confronted with a challenging truth revealed in sacred scripture itself. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. That is from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. It's a tough truth to hear, isn't it? It's a very tough truth. How can being confronted with it not lead us to despair? Well, because we know the certitude of faith that our Father, as St. Paul says in Ephesians 24, is rich in mercy. Our Lord is rich in mercy. It is the mystery of the Father's mercy that we find in the words of Pope Francis, a wellspring of joy, serenity, and peace. Yet we can only enter into this mystery when we recognize that it is a mystery for us. This story helps to explain what mercy is. There's a story told about a mother who appeared before the emperor seeking pardon for her son. But the emperor said, ma'am, your son is a three-time offender. Justice demands his death. The mother said, emperor, I did not ask for justice. I beg for mercy. The emperor replied, the boy does not deserve mercy. The mother said, sir, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. And mercy is all I ask. The emperor exclaimed, well, then I shall have mercy. And the mother's son was saved. We are saved, dear friends, not because we earn the gift, not because we deserve it. Mercy is a free gift from a loving and generous God. The mystery of mercy is for us. God knows what we need in our human condition. He recognizes our failings and weaknesses, even when we choose to ignore them. Yet he still offers us his mercy. Jesus reveals the Father's mercy when he instructs Peter on how we are to forgive. Not seven times, but 77 times, which really means to never stop offering forgiveness. We can only forgive others in this way because this is how God has forgiven us in Christ. The mystery of mercy is for us because it brings about that true happiness that we all seek. How much do we hide our faults and weaknesses? Because we believe that naming them aloud or even thinking about them will bring about unhappiness. Perhaps this seems to be a logical conclusion based on our experiences. Not only strangers, but even family members and friends in their own weaknesses might use our faults against us, belittle us because of our shortcomings in ways big and small. Sadly, I'm sure that at one point in life or another, we've all been on that side of such treatment. It's a terrible experience, but sadly, an all too common one. Unfortunately, we can bring these ideas formed by the brokenness of humanity to our understanding of God and his offer of reconciliation through the church. We need to be reminded again and again that God wants us to see our need for his mercy, not in order to use our failings against us or belittle us, 
Our God would never do that. But the opposite, to bind our wounds, to heal, to comfort, to transform. May we never forget that simple yet powerful prayer of Jesus at the very moment he suffered most for our, on our sins, pleading on the, car, on the cross, Father, forgive them. And so we cry out in the psalm, in the words of the psalmist in Psalm 51, verses 3 and 4 and 12 and 14. Have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness, in the greatness of your compassion, wipe out my offense. Thoroughly wash me from my guilt and of my sins, cleanse me. A clean heart create for me, O God, and a steadfast spirit renew within me. Cast me not out from your presence and your Holy Spirit take not from me. Give me back the joy of your salvation and a willing spirit sustain in me. I suggest to your friends that every Friday, if you can, to pray Psalm 51. Pray it before you celebrate it, the sacrament of reconciliation. Pray it after you receive God's absolution. A prayer that I say daily comes from Psalm 51. A clean heart create for me, O God, and a steadfast spirit renew within me. This is precisely what we experience in the sacrament of reconciliation. God creates a clean heart and renews our spirit. And we know the feeling as soon as we leave the confessional. A clean heart, a renewed spirit. Whether you practice the faith daily or have been away from the church for a while, I suggest that you celebrate the sacrament of reconciliation, not the week before Easter, but really now, at the beginning of this sacred season. In this sacrament, we express our sorrow for our sins and ask God to create within us a new heart, a heart more fully attentive and open to Christ. God invites us to work with him to place Christ back at the center of our lives so that he may shine forth in our words and deeds. Our response is all the more urgent because turning away from God also damages the bond that unites us. How great is our need for unity in these times, in our country and in our church? Reconciliation heals that brokenness and also has a revitalizing effect on the life of the church, which suffered from the sin of one of her members. You see, when one sins, the whole body suffers. Yet when one seeks forgiveness, the body is refreshed. That's why sometimes you you always hear people say, well, why can't I just tell God I'm sorry in the privacy of my room? Well, we can do that. But it's never sufficient. When one sin, the whole body suffers. When one seeks forgiveness, the whole body is refreshed. It's an act of communion. When we humbly acknowledge the suffering we have caused and ask for God's mercy, we share in God's work of caring for Christ's body, the church, because we are her members. Reconciled and reunited with our Lord, we turn to the three Lenten practices and disciplines that orient our hearts to humility and prepare us for the resurrection. On my Ash Wednesday homily this year, I suggested that we all pray for the gift of humility. Humility is not just the ability to take oneself not too seriously. That reminds me of a, another humorous story, but a humorous story about a uh, Don Shula. I don't know if you ever heard of him or not. He was a famous football coach for the Miami Dolphins. And right when he was in the, the kind of the core of his popularity, he and his wife and three children went away to a, a remote town just to get away from it all and to be on a vacation. And they were somewhat bored. So one night they went into the town where there was the only movie theater in town. It was in the middle of nowhere. And he and his wife and the, and the three children walked into the movie theater 
And there were like 15 people there and they all stood and, and started to applaud and applaud. And Don Shula turned to the, to the people and he said, I, I have to tell you, I, I'm just so honored. I, I, I can't believe that, that you'd recognize me, that you know who I am. And then one guy shouted back, sir, we have no idea who you are. We were just told unless five more people came, they were not showing the movie tonight. So <laughs> humility does help us not to take ourselves so seriously. But it's so much more than that. And that's why I say we pray for it at the beginning of Lent. It helps us to see who we are in the sight of God, his beloved and his chosen one. And nothing ever changes that. Humility help us, helps us to acknowledge that at the same time, we are sinners. We are weak and in need of God's mercy. And humility helps us to understand that there's nothing we can accomplish There is nothing we can transform in our lives or change in our lives without the help and divine assistance of the Lord. Throughout this Lent, pray for humility. The first discipline is prayer. Our church teaches that prayer is the raising of one's mind and heart to God and that humility is the foundation of prayer. Humble prayer helps us to understand that God is God and we are not. One quick little joke there reminds me of this uh, young woman. She got engaged and she wanted her father, uh, her boy, her fiance to meet her father and was a little bit nervous about it because her father was very particular about who his daughter would marry. So the, the young girl introduces the, the father to uh, her fiance, and he said, I want to talk to this young man by myself. And so they go into this room, and the, young, uh, the father says to the young man, listen, my wife is, uh, my daughter is used to the finest of education. Uh, what are you going to do about that? He says, God will provide. Father said, well, listen, she's used to traveling a lot, traveling around the world, and I want my grandchildren to be able to do the same. What are you going to do about that? And he said, well, God will provide. He said, well, you know, she's used to having the best of, you know, technology. And I want my grandchildren and all to have all that. What are you going to do about it? And the young man said, God will provide. And so the interview is over. And, of course, the daughter is outside with her mom saying, so, Dad, Dad, what do you think of this guy? And he says, I kind of like him. He thinks I'm God. So so sometimes in prayer, we cannot be acting as if everything depends on us or that everything depends on someone else. Prayer is saying, you alone, God, are the source of all that I seek and desire. And to you, I lift up my heart and soul. Since the very beginning of the church, Christians have started and ended each day with prayer. It's the perfect starting point of the day ahead. And by reflecting on all that occurred throughout our day in prayer, we know better what must change if we are to arise tomorrow in greater spiritual health than what we did today. I always think, dear friends, just to get a pulse and a check on our spiritual life, at least pay attention closely to how you begin the day and how you end the day. We all remember being taught the morning offering. I think it's a great prayer. Just to be reminded, instead of getting up and getting on that treadmill and getting on that busy pace we're heading to, to offer everything to God. Do not start the day without that morning offering. And you know, at night, one of the greatest prayers that we can offer is when we're able to say to the Lord, enough is enough. You know, Lord, I worked hard today, put in a lot of hours. I gave you my best, didn't get everything done. There's still a lot to do tomorrow, but you know, it's enough. Let me just now rest. Let me just talk to you for a little bit and entrust everything into your hand. That night prayer can be really an act of faith. Avoid working and working and working to the very end. And then the only thing you have to give God is 
just being drained and just saying a few words and crashing. That's not the way we want to do our night prayer. So pay attention to Slant. How are you beginning your day? How are you ending your day? There are different ways in which we can listen to the voice of God in our life. Silence, which is so rare in our busy lives, is one of the most important. So often we are making too much noise to hear our Lord speaking to us. Rest in silence. Recognize his presence. That's one of my pet peeves, honestly, in our diocese when we have holy hours. We've had some very beautiful holy hours in our diocese recently. It's called Uplift Arlington. Holy hour for people dealing with anxiety and stress in the midst of these very challenging times. A holy hour in January for peace in our nation when there was so much turmoil. Just recently in January, holy hour for the reverence of all human life. And people with good intentions plan these holy hours. And yet I notice that there's always a trend where we want to fill all 60 minutes. We want to read and preach and sing and do litanies. And all those things are good. All those things are good. But I always ask, where is there the time for silence? There's no song, there's no preaching, there's nothing that can take the place of that. When we have a holy hour, now time for people to be still and to be quiet and to be silent in the Lord's presence, something we must make sure we're doing in our own lives. And additionally, we must take time to sit and reflect upon sacred scriptures. The timeless truths of the Bible remind us of God's eternal nature and the eternal reward those who devote their lives to him will receive. We must make it a practice within our morning and evening prayer to read scripture, to listen to God's voice. And we also need communal prayer, admitting the challenges presented by the current pandemic. I understand that. But there are some things perhaps we still can do together. During Lent, the church gathers for devotions, such as the Stations of the Cross, We celebrate frequently the sacrament of reconciliation. Yes, even if it is only the confessor and the penitent, as I said earlier, it is still communal prayer, both for the reasons we have already discussed and because of the great benefits of our regular participation in it. For frequent confession is not a mere ritual repetition or psychological exercise, but a serious striving to perfect the grace of baptism the commitment of which we renew in a special way at the great Paschal Feast. We strive in this way so that as we bear in our body the death of Christ, his life might ever be more clearly within us. Above all, we celebrate the Eucharist through our taking part in the sacrifice. Listen to some of the words we pray during this sacred season, that through the yearly observances of Holy Lent, We may grow in understanding and of the riches hidden in Christ and by worthy conduct, pursue their effects. And that we bring before God as the fruit of bodily penance, a joyful purity of heart. And that receiving communion, we may be cleansed of wrongdoing and make us heir to the joys of heaven. And that God's protection may keep us ever safe. All those who trust in God's mercy. All of these dedicated ways of praying and others we gauge in during Lent inform how we act at every other moment in our lives. These specialized moments of prayer shape us so that we are better able to follow the will of God who desires, as we hear in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, In all circumstances, give thanks. Fasting, the second Lenten practice, requires the spiritual strength that comes from God alone, and it presumes a relationship with God in prayer. Recently, I was on an interview on one of the um, talk shows, cable talk shows, and the anchor uh, was asking me some ideas about Lent, uh, and very, very good man. And he was saying, you know, Bishop, we we used to hear 
uh, that we're supposed to fast, you know, like you give up candy or give up cake or give up uh, television or whatever. But, you know, I was thinking that it's really not about giving up. It's about doing. It's about doing more. And I was trying to explain that, yes, that's the whole purpose of fasting. You know, the fasting reminds us that only God can desire uh, our deepest longings. And that fasting, you know, leads us, you know, to fill that emptiness with good works and good deeds. I did agree with him on that point. But then I turned to him and I said, but guess what? As your spiritual advisor, I'm still saying give up something for Lent. And I think we're never too young or too old to do that. It's a healthy reminder of what we need to to hear. A stark reminder of our dependency on God. Fasting is challenging because through it, we experience our human frailty. Consider, for example, how hunger can make us quick to anger or frustration. That is why through prayer and self-discipline, we strive to protect Christ's presence as our sure spiritual foundation. Recalling that he was tempted by the devil only after his 40-day fast in the desert, as we heard in today's gospel, we turn to Christ because he intimately knows our human weaknesses, including the temptations we face. You know what true fasting is? It's a symbolic expression of our detachment from sin. What we fast from is not necessarily sinful. Cake, candy, it's not necessarily sinful. For example, during Lent and other times, we fast from such foods that we ordinarily need to sustain our life as sacred beings. Symbolically, however, fasting shows that we are committed to keeping Christ at the center of our lives amidst the needs and wants of this world. Through fasting, we demonstrate our will not to be distracted, to remain focused on our Lord. Fasting expresses we are committed to basing our life on his divine plan As we said earlier, thy will be done. We can also view fasting as placing a restriction on ourselves on what is non-essential or even harmful so that we can be more truly free by living a deeper communion with God. All of us, dear friends, have to deal with areas of servitude, whether in regard to smoking or alcohol consumption Misused sexuality, uncontrolled gambling, spiritual obsessions, use of stimulants, immoderate use of the Internet, excessive amounts of television watching or preoccupation with other forms of entertainment. By fasting and self-denial, by living lives of moderation, we have more energy to devote to God, God's purposes and a better self-esteem that helps us to be more concerned with the well-being of others. Therefore, during Lent, we do not take the practice of fasting lightly. Whatever we fast from, the purpose is always to lead us to God as well as to others. So in Lent and during this season, We also place special importance on Fridays, on which we abstain from meat. Since the beginning of the church, Christians have observed Friday as a day of penance. Through the precise penitential disciplines on this day have developed over the centuries. Friday, as you know, was chosen because it traditionally is associated with the day of the week on which Christ died for our salvation. Good Friday. Friday is always referred to as a preparation day, drawing from the theology of the Gospel of John that Christ is the sacrificial lamb crucified on the day that lambs were prepared for Passover. And even outside of Lent, Friday should be in each week something of what Lent is in the entire year to prepare us for the weekly Easter that comes to us every Sunday. In the end, our Lenten fast and all our fasting should strive for the true fast that God reveals through the prophet Isaiah, who also proclaims the rich fruits of such fasting. If you have your Bibles with you, Isaiah 58, 6 to 11. This rather is the fasting that I wish, releasing those bound unjustly, untying the thongs of the yoke, 
setting free the oppressed, breaking every yoke, sharing your bread with the hungry, sheltering the oppressed and the homeless, clothing the naked when you see them, and not turning your back on your own. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your wounds shall quickly be healed. Your vindication shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove from your midst oppression, false accusation, and malicious speech, if you bestow your bread on the hungry and satisfy the afflicted, then light shall rise for you in the darkness, and the gloom shall become for you like midday. Then the Lord will guide you always and give you plenty, even on the parched land. He will renew your strength, and you shall be like a water garden, like a spring whose water never fails. That is the fasting to which the Lord, our God, calls us. An almsgiving. St. Leo the Great said, There is no more profitable practice as a companion to a holy and spiritual fasting than that of almsgiving. This past year has been a time of heightened awareness of the importance of giving our time and our treasure. And I have to say, dear friends, in our diocese of Arlington, and I know in dioceses throughout the country, I've spoken to many of my brother bishops, it has been all inspiring to see the generosity of people. There's something good within all of us. And when we hit a time of need, as we have been through this pandemic, to see how people with means have been so considerate of others, contributing to those ministries that help to feed the hungry, uh, to clothe the poor, to provide counseling, to help with rent. It's been absolutely amazing to see. And more than ever, that almsgiving is being asked of us. We all remember the story of the poor widow, all that Jesus asked, just give me what you have. Whatever you have is not too small, as long as you give it to me, trusting that I will use it miraculously. Works of mercy are also especially important during Lent, because this solemn season, we journey with Christ toward Jerusalem, uniting our trials and sufferings to his he reveals to his disciples how he is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. Read with me, if you can, Matthew 25, 31 to 40. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne and all the nations will be assembled before him. And he will separate them one from another as a shepherd sep separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. A stranger and you welcomed me. Naked and you clothed me. Ill and you cared for me. In prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of the least brothers of mine, you did for me. During the current pandemic that has reshaped our lives in so many ways, it can seem difficult to carry out these works of mercy because of the protocols and the distancing, all those kind of things, which we have to be concerned for others. But nevertheless, if we think creatively, we still can find ways to bring the joy of Christ's gospel to those in need. And by doing so, share in that joy ourselves. When giving alms, make an effort to support those impacted by the coronavirus your local parish and diocesan Catholic charities can certainly help. Let me just give you some practical examples during this time where protocols are, are impacting our lives. To feed the hungry, offer to bring grocery to the elderly or to others who might be especially vulnerable. To give drink to the thirsty, be a responsible consumer in how you purchase and consume drinking water, ensuring enough remains for everyone. 
to shelter the homeless, donate sanitizing products and toiletries to a local shelter. Boy, people are always in need of them. While we cannot visit the sick person, vi- while we cannot visit the sick in person, technology can be a wonderful means of connecting people safely. Our priests and, and, and parishioners have done such a great job with that. Offer to make regular phone calls or video calls to the homebound. Again, visiting those in prison is not possible in person now, but consider writing letters or providing other outreach to help those in prison who feel isolated and alone. Engage in the work of burying the dead by reaching out to loved ones of the deceased through letters or calls. Maybe someone who who lost someone this past year or visiting a cemetery and praying for the dead. In all these ways, even in these challenging times, we can continue to offer alms. Dear friends, as we participate in Lent through prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, following a year filled with hardships, we know with the certainty of faith that our preparations lead to the joy of the Paschal Feast. Last Lent, when so much was shut down, when we were physically far from one another, when we were experiencing fear of the unknown, Pope Francis reminded us, he said, Embracing Christ's cross means finding the courage to embrace all the hardships of the present time, abandoning for a moment our eagerness for power and possessions in order to make room for the creativity that only the Spirit is capable of inspiring. Embracing the Lord in order to embrace hope. That is the strength of faith which frees us from fear and gives us hope. These words are as fresh and meaningful today as they were a year ago. And this Lent is another opportunity for us to grow closer to our Lord through prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. It is my prayer, therefore, that this Lent will be an occasion for each and every one of us to deepen and express an interior conversion of heart through works of penance, especially prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. It is my hope that these penitential disciplines will be an avenue for finding deep joy in the working of God's grace in your life. Through prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, may our Lord Jesus bless you with his joy and peace and sustain you in his love and mercy throughout the sacred season of Lent and always. Thank you so much for your kind attention, for listening, and let us promise that we will continue to pray for one another. Thank you, everyone. Bishop Burbage, this is from Sharon. She says, can you expand on the corporate connection of our sin as members of the body of Christ? Um, to be aware of how my sin affects others. Right. Yeah. And so we talk about what well, we always talk about that we are in communion with one another. That's how God created us, right? To in his own image and in likeness uh, to live together, to form the body of Christ. And so there is nothing that we say or do that in one way does not impact the, the body itself. Uh, and so there are what we know with, with sin, there are always consequences. And this, the consequences do not just uh, are not just in a personal way. Uh, it, it damages the union. Uh, it fractures the union that's supposed to be there. Um, and, and we all we could all think of practical examples of that. You know, um, if, if I'm being if I'm sinning through uh, selfishness, I'm being selfish with with what I I, I uh, my possessions, I'm clinging or whatever. Well, that's not just a sin against me. I am depriving the community of what naturally belongs to them. So God never created us to be in isolation. So we don't love in isolation. We don't sin in isolation. Your Grace, we have a question coming from from Anne. I think it's a really good question. It says, how do we know for Lent that we are doing enough penance, almsgiving, fasting, and prayer? And how do we find the balance between doing enough and trying to do too much and then giving up? It's, a great, it's like an American question, you know, because we always want to jump in and do more. 
Right. That, that, that's a very good question. And, um, you know, again, I think it begins with prayer, right? It begins with uh, discernment. Um, you know, I, I don't think we just should begin Lent by making a list of this is what I'm giving up, giving up, giving up. This is what I'm doing, doing, doing. It's like to have that moment of prayer of discerning. I think what we do for Lent is a, is a, is a discernment. Where am I right now, Lord, in my life? And what are those practices that will help me to become that new creation that you want me to become and allow me to become through the great joy of of Easter? And so throughout Lent, I mean, the Lord wants us to stay uh, attentive. Uh, He wants us to stay awake. Uh, He wants us to stay healthy uh, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. So if we are going to a certain extreme where, uh, we're, it, it's, it's impossible because what we're giving up that I can even stay awake and be attentive during prayer, or I'm getting sick, or I can't carry out my duties with well, the Lord. That's not what the Lord is asking us to do. He wants us to be strong and steadfast, attentive and awake at our very best. Uh, And so so that healthy balance uh, that we talk about in life is also very necessary in in Lent. And and don't forget, God's not measuring uh, so much the quantity, but rather that that quality. If I say if I say I'm going to do something, then be all in with that, you know, Uh, and, and, and don't try to do everything. We can't do everything. Focus on on something that that really, you know, will help to to kind of just bring you to that next level God wants you to be in. And don't don't be overwhelmed. If Lent begins overwhelming you and you just keep getting down because you, you set the bar so high and you just keep getting frustrated and frustrated and frustrated, then, then you're probably taking too much on. I always try to say, try to take Lent day by day. How did I do today? This is what I told God I was going to do. How did I do today? You know, not looking at the whole 40 days because that can be overwhelming. Just go day by day. Your Excellency, Aaron asks, do you have any advice for those of us who wish to practice almsgiving but have very little of our own to give? How do we fulfill this obligation? Yeah, and I would say that, again, that that amount uh, with the poor widow, it doesn't matter, you know, if, you know, the two coins or whatever uh, is enough because God will use that miraculously. If we're without means, uh, you know, financially, uh, certainly, you know, the offering of, of our of our prayers uh, is probably one of the greatest gifts that we can can give uh, to others who are in need uh, and our in our time and our talent. You know, uh, sometimes people do not have the resources, but they have a gift or they have a talent that they can share or, you know, offer to volunteer or whatever. So we all have something to offer and it varies from one person to another. And what really matters is the love in which we, we give it to God. Your Grace, um, there's a couple of questions coming in. I'm just going to consolidate regarding preparation for the sacrament of penance and asking for your recommendations, um, how to benefit, fully benefit from this, from this, the, this holy sacrament and uh, to, how to prepare myself, you know, to approach it in the best way so that I can get, receive all of the, fr- all of the fruits. Yeah. And um, again, I think that, you know, it, humility, pray for the gift of humility to uh, go before the Lord. And, and no matter what the sin or what the failure or mistake it may be for those who are sorrow, sorry, those who are promising to, to amend their lives, there's no sin greater than his mercy and love. Um, you know, we had that great image, uh, you know, the Sunday before last uh, of the leper, you know, the leper, Lord, if you wish, uh, you can make me clean. And the Lord said, I do wish. And the man was healed. We all have, can detect in our lives, uh, our unique leprosy, uh, something in our lives that's not clean, uh, something that needs to be healed. And, I I really think that, and we probably all know this from our own experiences, that the uh, best confessions that we make are when we do not try to hide or disguise, but really to put it all on the table, to name it. We always know that healing takes place when it's acknowledged and when it's named. Uh, And sometimes... Perhaps we've had the experience where 
we kind of only told a little bit of what we said and kind of wrapped it around general, you know, in general terms. I think the Lord wants to say, no, don't you trust me? Name it. What, what, say it. What is it? Say it. Give it to me. Give it to me. I do will that you be clean. And so I, I, I pray that when you go into that sacrament of penance, that, that you're, you're, not, you're not holding anything back. Uh, you're giving it all to the Lord. And by doing so, you're allowing him to heal you. And so I think that's very, very important when we make our confessions. And Grace, just one more question coming in that I think is, um, that is, uh, is, is a good question. It's helpful, I think, to a lot of us is, you know, we go to confession time after time. And, and often, oftentimes uh, we find ourselves confessing the same sins. The question, what, what do we do with this? I mean, we want to be healed. And yet we continually come with the same sins over and over again. Yeah, and again, it reminds us that, you know, that we are weak, uh, that we are in the flesh, uh, and we're in need of constant healing uh, and renewal. You know, the Lord never tires of patience uh, with us, and uh, sometimes we're too impatient with ourselves. We think that, all right, I do want to do better. I say it, and then I, you know, fall back into it, see I can't do this. I keep repeating the same thing. That's when I think actually, that's where I think actually where the evil one loves to work. He loves to get us to think that we can't do it, that we can't do it. Uh, You see, you, 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 you thought you were going to stop this and that you said you were sorry. Look at that. Five days afterwards, you did the same thing again. See, you can't do it. And, and and what the what what so what does that lead to? It leads to a, a despair. It leads to giving up, and then the evil one wins. And so what we have to do is saying is just to be patient with ourselves. And when we fall, the Lord allows us to pick ourselves up and to try again. And every time that we try again, even if we have to repeat something, the Lord delights in our efforts. Don't forget, the Lord blesses our efforts, too. He just doesn't bless our success. He blesses our efforts, our trying, our trying to to do again. And, you know, I often sometimes think of those. I love some of the healing stories in the Gospels, you know. You know, sometimes it's been 38 years and now the, the person was finally healed. You never know when that moment is where, you know, it, it finally worked. I, I, I confessed, I was forgiveness, and I'm not doing that anymore. We don't know when that will occur, but we got to give the opportunity to the Lord to forgive us and over and over again. He's never tires of doing that. And so we can never, as Pope Francis says, we can never be tired of asking uh, and to be patient. We have to be patient with ourselves or unless the devil's going to seize that. He's going to seize that. So we stop trying. Thank you, Grace. If you could please give us your apostolic blessing, we would uh, greatly appreciate that. Sure. I do pray, everyone, through the intercession of Mary, our mother, and St. Joseph, that our Lord Jesus will bless you in his love and mercy, keep you strong and steadfast in the faith, joyful in hope, constant in charity, keep you and all those you love safe and healthy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.